So much to talk about in uh, these uh, 80 minutes uh, that we have, uh, uh, Mr. Saleh, Mr. Al Zawi. To, to kick us off, uh, Afghanistan is a region of importance. Is a region of importance to the West, but also here in this region. Quite clearly, a number of countries are involved, have been involved uh, in in the dealings and the ongoings in Afghanistan. Could you perhaps for a couple of minutes, um, and then of course we dive into, into more detail in a couple of minutes, tell us where you see things in Afghanistan at the current moment. Thank you, Ali. Um, I think you're right. Uh, uh, Afghanistan is still a very important uh, uh, regional uh, position. Um, after what happened in, in last August and uh, we all realize that there is um, a big shift in the, in the political and also the secu uh, security situation uh, in West Asia. Um, UAE uh, have many relationships that are uh, you know, commercials, and I'm speaking from an official point of view, uh, commercial and also uh, security. We have also security concerns. Um, but also, we need to um, think that uh, Afghanistan has already been in decades of, of uh, unstable, instability, uh, terrorism, uh, poverty. So I think um, now most of us and also the international community, we need to assist uh, Afghanistan to come back and, and find ways for their people because they deserve a better life. Thank you so much for your initial remarks. From the view uh, from the UAE, so to speak, we will of course come back to you in just a moment to, to go into more detail and ask what the UAE, what role perhaps the UAE can and ought to play in the region. But let me go to Jim, Jim Bitterman here first. Jim, f you are an American based in Paris for many <laughs> decades. For the lack of Americans on this panel, I won't ask you to put on the Washington hat here, but, but of course, America's role is, is uh, extremely important here. Give us a sense in the first couple of well, minutes. Well, just to, just to contradict a little bit, uh, one of my fellow Americans, Stu Eisenstadt, who was just on the previous panel, and basically was saying that, it, uh, that uh, Afghanistan did not signal um, the uh, end of isolationism in the United States. It, 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 I, I think it is a kind of a neo-isolationism that we're seeing right now with the United States, that uh, after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, basically is a signal, I think, that uh, the U.S. is not going to fight any further um, regional conflicts that don't make uh, a big difference to their strategic ambitions, whatever the strategic policy is for the United States, strategic interests. Those are the things that are going to take the priority, and it'll be things like China and, and other things. But uh, the, the idea that we're going to become involved uh, in, in, in regional conflicts, it looks like, to me anyway, that uh, it's uh, no longer the case. Absolutely, and America's role here, uh, more than pertinent throughout 20 years, this has been America's lo longest running war sure. for two decades. Um, and all the questions that come with it, of course, what does mm -hmm. it mean for the future standing reputation, perhaps, of the U.S. moving forward? I'll come back to you sure. in just a moment. But let me go to Renault here, who is a very prestigious uh, war correspondent, senior reporter, who's been to Afghanistan more than a dozen times. You've written a book, Return to Peshawar. You've, you've experienced the Mujahideen, you've experienced the Taliban, and now you see a return of the Taliban, Renault. For the first couple of minutes, um, how surprised are you that things are the way they are in Afghanistan at the current moment? Je crois que c'est un moment très important, effectivement, dans l'histoire des relations internationales, parce que c'est la mort, je dirais, ignominieuse du néoconservatisme américain dans des conditions qu'on n'attendait même pas, si vous voulez. Personne dans nos générations croyait que les Américains allaient refaire le coup de Saïgon 1975, mais ça ne les a pas gênés. Ils l'ont refait sans nécessité, parce qu'il était très facile de garder la base aérienne de Bagram et de continuer la discussion avec les talibans, avec une carotte et un bâton, et obtenir un gouvernement unitaire ou d'unité en Afghanistan, qui n'est évidemment pas le gouvernement qui a été annoncé par les talibans. Je crois que ce qu'il faut bien comprendre dans toute cette histoire, 
c'est qu'il y a eu deux guerres d'Afghanistan. La première guerre d'Afghanistan, elle commence le 7 octobre 2001, avec l'intervention avec les missiles qui sont tirés contre Kaboul, et qui finit avec une intervention brillante de la CIA auprès de l'Alliance du Nord, avec Kaboul qui tombe le 13 novembre 2001. Donc c'est un très grand succès, et les talibans qui se retirent de toutes les villes afghanes et qui vont se réfugier dans les zones tribales au Pakistan. Et là, ce succès, cette libération de Kaboul, en tout cas ce qu'on appelle la libération de Kaboul, la liesse à Kaboul lorsque l'Alliance du Nord est arrivée, c'était les images sur toutes les chaînes de télévision, a provoqué une ivresse américaine qui s'est retrouvée dans la conférence de la conférence de Bonn du 5 décembre 2001, où les Américains ont décidé, euh, en fait, une deuxième intervention, qui était une, une intervention de National Building, euh, où ils ont promis euh, le, euh, le, de reconstruire l'Afghanistan, de démocratiser l'Afghanistan, je dis bien démocratiser l'Afghanistan, et de développer économiquement euh, l'Afghanistan. Ils n'étaient pas obligés de faire ça. Ça, ça, ça fait penser au, au, à la mission civilisatrice de la colonisation de Jules Ferry. C'est un projet absolument incroyable. Euh, mais euh, ils ont pris euh, cet engagement et Joe Biden a accepté cette intervention. Et il est même allé à Kaboul soutenir euh, ce projet grandiose euh, de démocratiser et de développer euh, euh, l'Afghanistan. Les Américains auraient très bien pu se contenter de la première guerre où ils avaient détruit tous les éléments arabes internationalistes qui se trouvaient euh, en Afghanistan et toutes les cellules euh, d'Al-Qaïda en Afghanistan, ils ont fait ce choix de, de nation building, d'une guerre d'intervention en, euh, en Afghanistan et ils ont euh, donné la tâche, n'est-ce pas, de... Euh, reconstruire l'Afghanistan à des soldats, les soldats de l'OTAN. Euh, et ça, c'est l'erreur, l'erreur incroyable, stratégique qu'a fait l'Amérique, c'est de, euh, de donner à des soldats de faire les pro Provincial Reconstruction Teams et euh, sans comprendre que le paysan afghan n'appréciait pas d'avoir chez lui des, des hommes étrangers en armes. Et après, tout a euh, après l'échec était déjà euh, signé à right. ce moment-là. Right. Uh, many, many important points that you have uh, raised here, Renault, as someone who knows Afghanistan very well, and perhaps the American uh, mistake of trying to engage in nation building um, and what that means uh, for the future. You have correctly pointed out, of course, that this has started with the war on terror post 9-11, which we have just commemorated the 20th anniversary of, of Mark, which brings me to you, because you wrote a book on uh, the war on terror, where Afghanistan, of course, is uh, prominently featured 20 years later, 20 years after the fatal attacks on the World Trade Center and and the Pentagon, the Amer Americans go in. Um, 20 years later, the hastened withdrawal, as Renault put it, with uh, Vietnam-like photos. And here we are, your opinions. Yeah, you're right, Ali. I mean, what we witnessed this summer was not just the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan. It's, it's actually the, the end of a strategic cycle, a strategic cycle that started 20 years ago with 9-11. And actually, it ended in a failure dramatic failure. So I agree with uh, Renaud Girard's comment. It's a very important event that we attended this, uh, this summer. Actually, the objective of this war on terror was defined by George W. Bush at the time, and there were three goals. Uh, the first one was to eradicate Al-Qaeda, and it was not done, actually. Al-Qaeda still exists. It's in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda Central, but also Al-Qaeda in uh, the Asian subcontinent. The second objective was to get rid of all uh, terrorist groups of global reach. Mm. That's a pretty blurred expression. And the fact is that 20 years ago, ISIS did not exist. But now we not only have Al-Qaeda, but we also have ISIS, which obviously is a terrorist group uh, of global reach. Mm. And then the third objective uh, was to neutralize or to eradicate the uh, actors, whether groups or states, that hosted uh, international terrorist groups. And obviously here, we're speaking about the Taliban. 
And not only uh, were the Taliban not defeated, but they are now in power uh, in Kabul. So obviously that's a major failure for the US, but also for the US allies uh, who were uh, very much involved in, in Afghanistan and France was part of the game. Yeah, so the war on terror uh, that uh, the US and the West in form of NATO has conducted for the previous two decades, now with the swift return of uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, most probably uh, you can argue whether it was a success or not. I, I think that uh, we will go into uh, more detail. But uh, Tatiana, let me come to you here because before we talk about the United States here, and rightly so, of course, because this has been America's longest running war, but before the Americans, the Russians were there. And, and I'm sure they have a thing or two to, to say about the current situation. They can draw from personal experiences. Absolument. Si je devais euh, résumer aujourd'hui l'attitude russe à l'égard de l'Afghanistan et à l'égard des talibans, je dirais qu'il y a une certaine euh, dualité. Monsieur Vitaly Naoum qui en avait mentionné que les talibans euh, fait partie de la liste des organisations terroristes interdites en Russie, ce qui donne lieu à des euh, formulations par les agences officielles d'information russe dans le genre le ministre des Affaires étrangères Sergei Lavrov a exprimé son soutien aux talibans, entre parenthèses, organisations terroristes interdites dans la Fédération de Russie, pour son soutien dans la lutte contre l'État islamique. Et cette dualité, on la retrouve en fait dans l'attitude à l'égard des talibans, parce que d'une part, il y a un bagage extrêmement lourd, le souvenir de la guerre des dix ans en Afghanistan, qui a beaucoup marqué autant les élites que les sociétés russes, et Vladimir Poutine, au mois de septembre, a dit que la Russie n'interviendra pas militairement en Afghanistan. Il a dit « Nous avons fait cette expérience, nous en avons tiré les leçons ». Et en même temps, depuis 2014, la Russie parle aux talibans. Ça, on peut rentrer un peu dans le dé détail comment et pourquoi. Mais selon les sources talibanes, euh, cette année, euh, la Russie fait partie euh, des trois premiers soutiens en matière financière, en matière de vente d'armes aux euh, talibans. Elle est dans une démarche très pragmatique de parler à toutes les forces, etc. Puis je pense qu'aussi il y a un point important à comprendre, c'est que pour euh, les Russes, aujourd'hui, l'ennemi principal, c'est l'État islamique. Donc elle voit les talibans un peu comme alliés dans cette lutte entre les deux mots, elle choisit le moindre. Et cette dualité-là, on la retrouve aussi à l'égard du retrait des Américains de l'Afghanistan. D'une part, c'est considéré comme une sorte d'opportunité géopolitique, et ça quand on voit les premières réactions dans les médias russes, dans les euh, shows télévisés, etc., c'est une sorte de satisfaction, les Américains n'ont pas fait mieux que nous, et ça nous laisse de la place et de la marge de manœuvre aujourd'hui pour faire mieux, ça va attirer les autres pays vers nous en tant que euh, fournisseurs de sécurité plus crédibles. Et en même temps, vous avez euh, les forces de sécurité et de renseignement qui sont extrêmement inquiets avec les risques sécuritaires que ça puisse générer. Yes, yeah, so, so very interesting. A bit of a mixed, if not schizophrenic, feeling in Moscow about the events in Afghanistan. On one hand, perhaps a dose of glee, if not schadenfreude, about the failure of the West and NATO in particular. But on the other hand, of course, security concerns uh, very much on their own. And when it comes to security concerns, uh, MK Narayana, and we're not far from India, of course. Uh, Afghanistan very much in the geopolitical proximity of your country and with the pertinent and uh, uh, crucial role that Pakistan, your neighbor, is playing in Afghanistan. I'm sure uh, Af Afghanistan, a country that you know well, has been very much on the radar. What's the view in New Delhi? What's the new from uh, <coughs> New Delhi these days? Uh, apart from the view of New Delhi, I think there's a view of all Indians. First and foremost, we're looking around the, the panel here. I'm the only one who re sees this as a South Asian tragedy. It's most of the others are out, I'm sorry to use the word, are outsiders. The Russians came in at one stage, and of course went back without doing. The Americans came, hoped to create democracy and uh, kind of thing, and they've gone back. And who are left to pick up the pieces? The nations of South Asia. Afghanistan is part and parcel of South Asia. What happens in South, South Asia is therefore a matter of great concern for each and every South Asian country. And that's the largest country in South Asia. And more so, a civilizational, uh, with civilizational links with Afghanistan, it goes, goes back many thousands of years. For us, the, Afga the Afghanistan tragedy 
is felt in every single home in India, apart from the governments involved. Because for most of us, particularly my generation, the Pathan was the most friendly soul in the Indian neighborhood. He was a very generous individual who looked at that. So, the tragedies that have fallen on, on Afghanistan over the years has been a matter of great deep concern for most, most Indians. So, for the first and foremost thing is the lesson that I think we need to, uh, which is the lesson which I heard a number of other speakers speak when they talk of the uh, Middle East and other places. Please take into view the opinions of the, the nations of the region and please don't impose solutions. And if you do impose a solution, don't do what happened in, um, by the Americans uh, recently. They just left. You must have an organized retreat. You can't leave the, a country in shambles. So we have a nation tragedy of certain. We have a South, greater South Asian tragedy. And I think that is the issue that we need to, because we have to now link up and find out what do we do next. And since you've given us me only a couple of minutes to begin with, I just want to add one more point. The last two days we have heard about the problems in the rest of the world, or many parts of the world at least. I think nothing symbolizes this more than the shambolic nature of what Afghanistan is today. There is clearly, clearly what I would call uh, a crisis of confidence in how to manage problems and, and difficulties. Whether the Taliban, now that it has taken power in Afghanistan, will be able to come in Afghanistan or not is still a matter of. I, for one, do not believe that the Taliban is capable of governing Afghanistan because Afghanistan is not one country. Afghanistan is a construct of several Pashtun tribes. They've never had a central authority. They've never been a single focal point. And if uh, President Bush, with whom with whom I have dealt with extensively and I greatly revere, thought that he could impose democracy on Afghanistan with all this, whether it is the CIA or the State Department, I think it was the biggest folly that anybody could have thought of. So I think we need to remedy this kind of thing. How will, how will we move forward is uh, the, the issue. But I leave it, since you don't want me to go into everything in the beginning, I, I will leave it at this point. And I just want to add one more point. I think Tatiana mentioned this, I think, that what is the result of foreign intervention? Oh, no, sorry, not Tatiana, it was Vitaly who said that. Two decades of foreign intervention. What are the, well, none of the objectives. I can at least understand if something was left behind. When Hamid Karzai was there, at least we had something like a, a democratic administration somewhere in place. Uh, the primary objective, as Vitaly explained, is the expert on terror. On the, in books, I'm on the, the man, terror on the ground, <laughs> having said it. Destruction of the terror networks like Al-Qaeda has clearly not happened. Al-Qaeda is stronger today than what it was, I would like to say. And, right. And I speak with knowledge. Then we have a lot of newer outfits. The Daesh has come into, into existence, the Islamic State, the ISISK. So, this has, been a this has been a great tragedy that has been visited on the people of South Asia. I leave it at that and I will talk to you. Uh, thank you. Day. Thank you. Absolutely. Much, many more points to be raised throughout this discussion for sure. And uh, your country's perspective and your experience is, is uh, extremely pertinent to this discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Narayana.